Okay. Chapter seven, as you see. Mm -hmm. And I'll first put a little classification to, I mean, I guess maybe a table of things a little bit boring, but I like, I like to be organized. I'm a table kind of a person. You know, just like at home, I like my socks in one drawer and underwear in another and different kind. I mean, I like to have stuff separated and organized and whatever. You know, call me crazy. But there's the opposite extreme where, you know, people that don't just don't sort their stuff out at all, you know. And they just have like a big tumbler of clothes, you know. If I did that, hell, I couldn't, I couldn't get dressed. I, I'd find like, you know, a couple of shirts and you know, mismatched socks and God dang, I can't find any pants, so I guess I got to go into work. So I end, up, I end up going to work with no pants on, you know, this is pretty bad. You know? So I have to be organized. And I, and I think it would behoove all of you. Anyway, um, here's differential equations. Here's, here's a classic, they, here's a classic here. It's called first order. It's called first order because it only has a first derivative and there's only one of them. That's what, means, that's what the word first means. Um, compared to second order, you see a second derivative or two of them. And so it's, it's, in the, it's in, that's what first order means. And then it's in the linear category why that keeps changing on that. And it's in the linear category because the dependent variable theta only occurs to the first power. Either its derivatives and their function only occur to the first power. You don't see any theta to the fourth. You don't see any sine of theta. You don't see any anything that's not a straight line in theta. So that's your classic first order linear equation. And you know, this is the simplest of them. That said, it's arguably it's certainly up the top couple of importance, you know, absolutely. I don't know, I guess those that do mechanical vibrations would call this one the most important, but this one certainly is in the top couple of importance of differential equations of all time. And anyway, we'll learn how to solve that one. You can have a lot that are not linear, like the pendulum, like some of the biological problems. I, I plan on either assigning or showing a example of modeling the virus, for instance, using sets of differential equations. The problem I thought years ago was very interesting and unfortunately it's very relevant now. Um, and those are quite nonlinear, you see, and they don't fit this pattern. But anyway, we'll learn how to solve them all. We'll, have, we'll, we'll learn how to solve one of them, one of them nonlinear, we'll learn how to solve two of them, a second order or two. You see, this could be, this could be a competing species, you know, predator and prey or could be thing. Linear or nonlinear. As a matter of fact, and when we're done with this section, you will know how to solve n simultaneous nonlinear differential equations. See this box here? A hundred simultaneous, very complicated differential equations. I never, when I was your age, the, the tools we had, we never even discussed this. Was it not even something was this? We didn't even. This would have been so difficult that we didn't even say, oh, we're not covering that because it's too difficult. It wasn't even mentioned. I mean, they didn't know the existence of this. I mean, the good and the bad of today is we have these wonderful tools, a la MATLAB and such, that we can see this box that's, that's highlighted here. We can solve these equations. You, sophomores, will learn here in the ensuing weeks how to do it. But, Okay, that's, that's the good. The bad is also that, is that now is more expected of you than when I was in school, because you couldn't, I mean, you couldn't ask students then to solve this, you just couldn't do it. So as a result, you have higher technology use, which means actually there's more expected of you, a higher level of technology and, and expertise and things expected as you're coming out of school. So it's good and bad. You can solve harder problems, but you're expected to also. Anyway, um, this first chapter seven, doesn't get into so much the solution of them, it just gets into the characteristics of them. And, and, and just an introduction thing, which is again, the, the professors could have taught me when I was a student, but they didn't. Or maybe they tried and I was too drunk, I don't know. I'm just kidding, I was kidding. I just sort of have to. Okay, autonomous versus non-autonomous, it's not absolutely critical, you know these words, but I think they're, they're useful. Autonomous means the thing runs on its own. That is, you set the equations in motion and you don't touch them and just see what they do. Non-autonomous means it's being, has at least some outside inputs. That is, you are physically grabbing the system 
and altering its course or you were putting external heat to the system or put a little voltage source out there doing something. And um, when it's not autonomous, the right-hand side of the differential equation can explicitly involve time. That is, you're doing something in time. It's not just a function of theta. The autonomous ones are like that. So we're gonna we're gonna work our way up now. Initial and value boundary problems. Okay. Let's say I gave you this equation right here. All right. And the thing in the thing that's outlined in blue is all I've given you. I've said th th let's say theta is money, the derivative. Let's say you've noticed. And this obviously this differential equation, this is used for demonstration. I and mean, we would you know never as a practical one, we wouldn't use this one. I mean, really. But that's how differential equations come to pass. Somebody say, somebody brilliant like Isaac Newton sits and he looks and he says, you know, I say, you know, that object, that projectile, it seems to be moving in a nice straight path un unaltered if you don't touch it. Only if you put an unbalanced force will it change. Thereby, we have Newton's famous F equals MA, one of the cornerstones of all science, and certainly for mechanical engineers, arguably the most important equation. That, that sort of tied, probably that tied with the conservation of energy equation for mechanical engineers, F equals MA. But where did it come from? It came from somebody looking at the world he lived in and making an observation that someone happened to be the brilliant Sir Isaac Newton, you know. Um, but it, and that's what it takes. Sometimes it takes a, a person like that to observe and put it in mathematical form, um, you know, whatever. But that's where they come from. So let's say you observe that the theta, let's say theta is money. And you're looking at your money in your checking account and every day you wake up and there's eight dollars more than there was the day before and you have no idea how it's getting there like somehow the bank is putting eight dollars a day into my bank account i don't know i can't understand it just like isaac newton was a human being he was knighted and all that deservedly knighted for science isn't that amazing isn't that great the english actually knighted a scientist they knighted, they knighted musicians now, Sir Paul McCartney and things like that. Um, they should knight Alan Turing, who was supposed you know, to. But um, anyway, somebody came up. So every morning you wake up and you see there's magically $8 more. So your differential equation is my derivative of money with time is eight, where time is in days and, and eight is in, in dollars. Maybe it's in thousands. From this equation, can you predict how much money you'll have in the future? No, because you don't know where how much you started with. You see, you could do the indefinite interval here. You could do the indefinite interval to come up with this, but notice there's a C. So you clearly need a starting condition. So now, if you have that differential equation and a starting condition, let's say you started with $3, and then each day you notice you have eight more. Now you can solve the thing like this. At time equals zero, you had three dollars. At time equal one, you have eleven. At time equal two, you have twenty, you know, whatever it is, sixteen or nineteen or whatever it is. You want it, 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 like that. So initial conditions. That's an initial condition. How you started is a critical part of the mathematical model. That has bothered me because a lot of students. They think that the differential equation, that's it, you don't have to, oh, that's not important. It couldn't, it, it, often the differential equation is much, much more complex to derive. The initial condition is a statement. I started at three. And if I take points off here, a lot of points off, a student doesn't mention it. But professor, this is easy. It's, it's not a matter of easy. With, yeah, I don't care if you've, you've derived the most complicated differential equation of all time, but if you don't state the starting conditions, you can't get a unique solution. It's not a matter of something's easy or something's hard. It's a matter of uniqueness and completeness. You need initial conditions or else your problem model. The model is incomplete. Now, 
as a matter of interest over here, if you have a second order like this, how many initial conditions do you need? Hint, it's an integer between one and three. You have, now you have two players simultaneously interacting, so you need two initial conditions. You need to tell me how theta one started and how his friend or enemy theta two started. So these could be friends or enemies. These could be predator prey, right? This could be wolves and rabbits. Rabbits don't like the wolves because the wolves are mean and they catch them, they put them in pots and they stew them up and they eat them. But it doesn't matter in this differential set of differential equations, you have to tell me theta one and theta two, how they started. I will show you here, not today, but in about a week from now, how to take a second order equation, break it into two simultaneous first orders and do the same paradigm. So uh, you will also learn how to solve this classic um, mechanical oscillator equation and all the others, and all the others really. So we'll, we'll start here with this one, then we'll go to these, then we'll go to this. By the time we're done, you'll, you'll know how to do it all. This is an amazing section of the course. God is a sophomore, I wish I'd come out knowing how to do all this. Well, we didn't have, we couldn't because we didn't have tools. For, you know. So um, here's back to the initial condition type things. This graph shows you see if, if let's say some variable y is going through time and there's a y1 and a y2, you clearly have to have the initial conditions on both of the variables. Um, I, you know, the, the characters at hand are y now instead of theta, it doesn't matter what you call them. Um, you know, the variables gonna be, but you have to tell me what those two things are. On the other hand, boundary value problems, which I want you to have the perspective on that, which almost surely we will not have time in this course to get into, despite all the great stuff. And when you have a boundary structure, you have to tell the reader, you have to tell your model where you started on the left boundary, or what the conditions on the left boundary were, and what are the conditions on the right boundary. That's a different, that's a different kind of mathematics. In this course, time permitting, I'll get to the other one, but in this course, it's this kind of initial value problem that we'll be doing pretty much all the time. We have to give the initial conditions here. Okay. Now, let's get to some differential equation and something called phase portrait. Let's say it's an autonomous thing. That is, time is not explicitly in there, just to, you know, Feel for this thing. And let's say the derivative of theta with time is some function of theta. It could be anything. It's the math that you want, right? It's the physics of the problem. Well, you know, in your differential equation course, you learn like recipe driven ways to do things. You know, here's a recipe you will follow, these kind of things. There's these recipes you will follow. You will follow these recipes and I will give you test one. And if you don't follow the recipes, you will fail test one and you're a bad, bad boy or girl. Okay, that's what it is. Mm. Okay. And that's great. And most students go ahead and they do as they're told because they don't want to be bad boys or girls. And, and they do it. But they don't understand. And the trouble is they don't understand. And I'm not saying the students are bad for that. You know, you want to do well on test one. You want to do well in your classes. That's, that's not a bad thing but you can gain more, you can be given more insight, more feel, more understanding, and make a good grade. Those things can go together. That's what I'm trying to do here, right? If I gave you d theta d, uh, the, 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 here, you, you need to solve it. But before even solving it, I want to see what might happen. Let's say the right-hand side. Let's say I give you the right-hand side. Okay. And let's say as a first example, I give you the right-hand side as a some kind of a, um, Happy parabola, if you're looking thing like this. Okay, this is this, and you know, you know why I call that a happy parabola. Right? You see the teeth spiraling. Right? So anyway, there it is. And there's a phase. There's a phase point. I haven't even. I haven't specifically even given you what f of theta is. All I've shown you is a graph of it. And what I want to show you is that you can gain an amazing amount of information. Okay, right now. Probably no one can do this right now. You will be able to do this in a few minutes. I don't know what time it is. Um, if I said, look, there's a differential equation. It has some unknown form on the right-hand side. And I told you, this is all you know, solve it. I said, and I said, sketch the 
sketch data versus time. So, mommy, dude, you're crazy. Of course I'm crazy. But if I said, I'll give you a little hint. I'm not going to tell you what the right-hand side is, but I'm going to tell you it looks like this. Now, sketch theta versus time. Now, sketch the differential equation for me. And what I'm going to tell you right now and maintain is that you can do that. You, you can't do it. Of course, a sketch, you can't get it perfectly accurate like a numerical solution on a computer, and you won't have all the tick mark left, but you can tell me what this differential equation is going to do. When I saw that many years ago, the first time, I went, God, that's cool as hell. And I've been showing people ever since. So how can I do that? Not even knowing the right-hand side, but having some idea that it does this. How can I know? Well, the technique here is, first of all, you start to look for the fixed points. You start to look for the fixed points. That is, points where steady state points. A fixed point is where this derivative here equals zero. Because when the derivative equals zero, the thing stops changing. When your change in money per change in time is zero, you're not getting richer or poorer. And it's good to know where those fixed points are because they're really useful for the differential equation. Now you can see that those different those two points are clearly where f of theta crosses the axis, goes from positive to negative. And it's this dot and this dot. It's those two dots right there. Now, so you know that the differential equation is probably heading towards those, or maybe. But I'm going to say there's more. If the current state of the system is right here, like you jump in and, and take a look at theta, whatever theta is, it's a pendulum swinging. Let's say it's a pendulum swinging. So theta is the angle of the pendulum swinging. And you happen to see it right here. Where do you think it's going to go from there? Do you think that the angle will be get larger or smaller? Now, on a graph, this is a typical graph. Larger is to the right, smaller is to the left. To the right is bigger numbers, as as most as almost all graphs are that you're used to. So from here, is theta going to get bigger or smaller? Go to the right or the left. Theta increases, so it goes right. Okay, you are completely right, and and that's an important thing. But could you give us a word of explanation on your thinking there? You're exactly right, but more important is how you can came up with that conclusion. Well, at that, well, at this point, or in this box, rather, um, all the values of f theta are positive, and f theta is the derivative, and the derivative of a function is how it changes over time, and if it's positive, the value is increasing. Beautiful. I was going to try to explain that, but I don't think I could have actually explained it quite that well. That's very good. Okay. Do you mind teaching the class on Monday for me? Okay, go ahead. No, no, I mean, explain to me how to solve problem two analytically, and I'll be glad to. Yeah, no, um, I can't. You know, if you're talking about the baseball one, it, you can't. Um, but anyway, did everybody hear that explanation? That was well stated. Um, at this point, the derivative is a positive number. Going back to the differential equation, if at a given instant in time, the change in data is a positive number, at that particular time. That means theta is getting bigger. So therefore, from this point, theta is getting bigger, which means it's heading there like the arrow is heading this way. Similarly, let's say theta was sitting right there. Let's say with the same logic, let's say theta is sitting at this point here. In other words, theta is this number right here. Or no, this is theta. This is the derivative of theta. From here, do you think theta is going to get bigger or smaller? Who votes for the wrong answer bigger? It's going to get smaller. It's exactly the same way. Just repeat what Christopher just said. At this point, the derivative is negative. And when the derivative is negative, the thing is getting less. When the derivative of your money with time is negative, you're losing money. Man. Sorry I to tell you that. You're going broke, which means you're heading towards negative number and heading in a negative direction. So right in here, you see, in the neighborhood of this point here, this is a fixed point, it's a steady state point, but we call it stable because 
even if you're a little bit on this side of it or a little bit on this side of it, you're always going to head towards the point. Now, on the other hand, let's say you're very close to this point right over here, this, this other fixed point, like right there. Now, what you'll notice here is that your fate is this number, but your derivative is negative. Negative is this way. That means this, this point is unstable. See, no matter how close you get to it, the derivatives are going to take you away. So no matter where you end up, what happens, you're going to end up at this point. Um, I want to let me maybe stop sharing for a minute. Okay, now, can you, can you all see me? Yes. You see this tool right here? Yes, that is a meter or yardstick. I can't tell. Maybe if I point this up at the roof. Okay, there we go. Okay, where would such a thing? Now, here's a pendulum. All right. Now, mathematically, this pendulum has two fixed points, has two steady points. One of them you're seeing right here, and mathematically, if you look at it, it has another possible fixed point. Straight, straight up like this. The demonstrations are better now. With once you solve the equations of the pendulum. Once you've analyzed the equation of the pendulum, you'll find that you have a fixed point. It's this one. It's stable because no matter what happens, it goes back this. And you have this other one that's a mathematical fixed point. That is a it's a it's a mathematical steady point. But the thing will never stay there. It's so unstable. Oh God! See that much as you try. Okay, grab it. Oh, okay. Please, everybody, okay out there? So. This seeming abstraction that I'm talking about here is really relevant and it has lots of applications, including my beloved pendulum. I'm never going to worry about a pendulum. It's also a disciplinary tool. Okay, share screen. So back to here and and just to, for my own sanity, you're seeing six, figure 7.3, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. I'll just, I end up talking and people aren't seeing it. But anyway, so you see, you can, you can glean a lot of information about the system by just knowing sort of qualitatively what it does. You know, you know that the pendulum is going to swing back and forth between this state here, although the direct up and down state is a mathematical steady state. I guess it's possible to put it there very carefully. Don't breathe, don't have any air current and it will stay there, but it's so unstable. The experiment will take it away. So that's what I'm saying in these, um, those are the kind of things I'm, I'm telling you in these, those, these uh, you know, little bulleted one, 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 two, five things. You know, arrows to the left means the derivative is, is negative, arrows to the right positive, and you find the fixed points, and, and that's what I'm trying to tell you here. Now, from that information, I maintain that you could sketch the solutions starting from various initial states. Now, as far as fixed points and nomenclature, I will call the fixed points something with a star. The, the superscript star means it's a fixed point. So there is fixed point one and fixed point two. I'll name them one and two, and the star means they're fixed points. So there's fixed point one there and fixed point two right there. And you can see starting from various initial conditions that you based on this phase diagram could have drawn now notice i've taken the tick marks off the graph but you more or less could have drawn these graphs following the logic we just mentioned what happens here what happens there what happens there and that's just some of the things you know i i, I grew up with the differential equation of course where you know you, you do this you, you follow a formula you don't understand to make a certain witch's brew, you put in a bunch of like whatever arsenic and you put in a eye of newt and you put in all stuff. And I was asked the professor, well, why do you put in eye of newt? Don't argue with me. Young Padawan, don't argue with me, young student. You put eye of newt. I am the grand professor. You do as I tell you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I will go along mindlessly and not understand what I'm doing, oh, oh, oh chosen professor. 
And I don't know, somehow that wasn't good enough for me. And when I saw this, like, oh my God. I, I think most of the pleasures don't know this, to be honest with you. Like the qualitative feel, the, the fact that it, the fact that a differential equation is telling a story. I think this is the most, the biggest miracle here. It's not just something where you follow an equation you don't understand because you're trying to avoid an F in differential equations. But these, when applied to physical problems or any other problem, are telling a story. What I'm trying to teach you is how to listen to the story because they are in profound sound stories because they will describe our, the world we live in that story, which is a very interesting one. I haven't actually associated this with anything. Actually, the thing I associate with kind of looks like it would be like for the pendulum, actually. But uh, this, this has lots of applications. So amazingly, now I will admit, I put this thing in a solver and I got the computer to generate these from precise numerical solutions. Okay. Because I wanted a graph for my notes. But you could draw this by hand, you see, if you want to. As a matter of fact, I'll give you a little exercise here. So, if you have a differential equation, let's say the right-hand side is the pendulum thing that looks like this, which is the side, and it'll repeat itself every two pi, but you'll find that, like, that point is, a, what, an uh, unstable fixed point. That's, that's, that would be the, you know, now and then this one over here would be stable. Yeah, because this one's very right there. And so you find the solutions look like this. So, given a different... And that's something I'll, at least when we had an in-person test, I'll see, is, is I'd give the students something like this. I said, there's a differential equation and I'll make up a little hand sketch of the right-hand side. I'm not telling you anything else except the right-hand side. And I have the students ask, some of the questions ask, where are the fixed points? And you have to look on the graph and pick them up. Then I'd ask you, are they stable or unstable? And then I'd ask them to sketch to the best of your ability, it won't be perfect, but do a hand sketch of the solution starting from various initial conditions and more, with more or less catching the feel of the problem. A skill that now in the, in the last few minutes, and, and, and I know everybody doesn't understand every word, you know, some of this stuff you're gonna have, some of you, a lot of you are gonna have to take time to digest to get it, but I, in these last few minutes, have given you the skill to do that. Positively amazing, in my humble view. Notice that this problem actually has an analytical solution if you want to struggle through it, but the analytical solution, like it's so complicated and weird, it's like hard to even see what it's doing, you know? Ah, oh, it's doing that. Um, so th that's a beautiful section. And I'd, I'd love everything to be nicely graphed. Unfortunately, when you get two simultaneous equations, three simultaneous equations, you don't have enough you don't have enough dimensions on a two-dimensional piece of paper to show all the information you want however the insights that you have gained from this last few minutes of discussion carry over to two three four dimensional equations where you cannot you know draw me a four dimensional you can draw a two-dimensional space x y you can draw three dimensions by having the third axis poke out in kind of a three-dimensional looking graph Draw me the fourth and four dimensional ground. Well, you can't, I don't know how. Unfortunately, you get too many variables to show them all on a two dimensional piece of paper. However, the lessons learned still pertain. Just like in, in I guess it's kind of similar to, to algebra, linear algebra. I showed most of my examples on a two by two because I could draw them. But the lessons learned, the features, the characteristics on the two by two that we learned exactly carry over to a 10 by 10 or 100 by 100 that I have no chance of drawing because I don't know how to draw a 100-dimensional space on a two-dimensional piece of paper. But the lessons we learned and all those beautiful graphs and the and, and issues fought, carried on. And that's can be said here. Now, you could, but you have even something as little as put time into the picture. That is an explicit function of time, so non-autonomous. That is, you're actually grabbing the system and thinking, now you see at every, at every instant, you have to show time and theta. So now you need another dimension and but the same thing. So now one thing you can do is something like they call slope fields. That is at any F and time, you could draw a little arrow because at any F and time, 
if I gave you this thing right here, you can tell me what this is and what direction it's going. So you can draw a little slope field and you can follow the little arrows around. And that's kind of a cool thing, not quite as cool as the one I just did. Uh, again, I, I would do this for every problem. What I did here for every problem, except how do I show, I don't have enough dimensions on a physical piece of paper to do it. So you have to do it in your mind. You have to visualize it. Sort of. I just love this section right here. And even though I can't draw it, the, the images continue for me if I'm solving a 10 by 10 equation. That's a beautiful thing, I think. Um, okay. Where might you get some of these? Now this, this section is kind of a warm up. Where might you get some of these things? And let me take a couple minutes to it because this one you will have. If you're a typical sophomore, you haven't been to heat transfer yet, but you will get to this one. And this lumped thermal equation is covered. You know, some, some professors have a selection of stuff. They, they cover some things and not others. The best of my knowledge, every professor has ever taught heat transfer has covered this topic. And then you'll see it more in your other side classes. It's called lumped capacity because in the thermal system, we consider that the temperature varies only with, at, only with time. It does not vary across the material with position. So therefore, the temperature represents the whole material at that time. Now at a different time, different temperature. So you've got the potato cooling. If you have a potato cooling on your counter, you know that the surface is a little bit colder than the interior. But you're assuming for analysis that the entire potato cools uniformly. That's what this is about. You just now here's the set. I mentioned Newton's law. Here's the second of the two most important laws of Ross mechanical engineers, conservation of energy. And if you take, if you end up, I don't know, I haven't taught heat transfer in a while, but if you take it, just, just like if I taught statics and dynamics, I would say F equals MA every day, F equals MA every day. When I teach heat transfer, I say conservation of energy, conservation, I say it every day, many times. And students, then I ask the students, a question, you know, a rhetorical question. Now, what the, what principles should we use here to start this problem? And they just, they, you know, like even a kid that's asleep, you know, I'll go kind of embarrassing. You know, if, if, if you're asleep in my class and I go up and ask you a question, just say conservation of energy. That's probably the answer. Wake up out of deep slumber. Conservation, great. You were paying attention now. Conservation of energy. So, just like with money, the rate of change of money or whatever, rate of change of energy is the rate of you're going to have two mechanisms. Where's the picture? Here's the little picture. You got the potato. The rate of increase in energy has to do with the rate of heat loss to the air, forget it, cool, plus the rate of heat generation, which could be from something like a microwave energy going through the material. So you're going to have the word statement, just like you'd make a, a word statement of your money, and here is the mathematics of it. To understand why the left side is a, is a rate of energy change, you have to understand specific heat. This uh, thing is Newton's law of cooling, simply like Newton has his hand everywhere. And this is volumetric heating, something like, like I said, microwave heating. And an electrical problem, it could be electric resistance heating. Something like this. this is a first order ODE, one first order, so you need to say the temperature that your potato started. You pull it out of a hot oven at 425 Fahrenheit. T equals 425 Fahrenheit. And I pull it out of the oven, put it on the counter. Or I put it in the oven at room temperature. I put it, the T initial was room temperature, you know, 300 Kelvin or 27 C or something. And, and then I put it in the microwave and subjected it to the microwave. We'll watch it heat up. Or any combination thereof. Now, so there it is. And, and again, you will see this. This is another one of these problems. We, we've got many problems in this course, but I promise you, you will see it. Last time's was the Moody diagram. I promise you'll see that. Pretty much everything in this section, we'll see again. This one, guaranteed, absolutely, positively. If you switch schools, if you go somewhere else in the world, you'll see it. Now, if you look at this differential equation, an amazing, you can amazingly, what it's going to do ahead of time because the derivative is the derivative is that 
I can't get a hold of it now, is that thing, which is a linear function of t. You can also easily get the fixed point or steady state point. You put this thing equal to zero and you find t equals, it's a sixth grade algebra problem, t equals heat generation in the Do I have it written out here? Not over the backboard. Um, I put it in I put it in a more dimensionless form. But what happens to you here is that fixed point is an easy algebra solve. Um, to, to simplify things, I put it into this form. I lumped all that row C stuff, and I called it a time constant because it has units of time, and it's often in, in the academic, in the industrial world called the time constant. And then all the source, the microsafe stuff is, is normalized. And so what you have here is like this. You have some kind of a fixed point offset because of the heat generation, and you have the slant going down this way, which means there is a fixed point and it's stable, of course. And so here are the here are the different temperatures. Here's the just say different temperatures, and you know darn well that was the case because let's say this let's say there's no heat generation. That's room temperature. Well, if you have a potato at room temperature and leave it, it stays there. Let's say you put a potato in the microwave oven up to here, pull it out. There it comes. Let's say you've had it in the oven, 500 degrees. There it comes. Let's say the potato started from the refrigerator. I mean, it's cold, it goes this way. Let's say the potato started in the deep freezer, it goes this way. And you know, you pull a potato out of the hot oven, the less hot microwave, room temperature, refrigerator and freezer, you put all five of them there and measured their temperatures and came back. First of all, you'd find them all at room temperature at the end of the day. And if you had an actual temperature, if you were recording temperatures with a thermometer, these are the kind of things you would record, the data recording. But our little equation told us that we're going to, if, if providing this is the correct physics, which it is, our little phase plot over here told us that that was going to happen. I just don't have the tick marks. If I, if I was to include the tick marks on the graph, you could actually pull out at two seconds, at you know, one hour, what's that? Right? That's amazing, really. I, mean, I don't know why I think it's so amazing. I think it's phenomenal. Same thing with an electrical circuit. You could do a little electrical circuit. This here, it's just like the potato cooling problem. You put a, you've got a resistor and a capacitor in series. Stick a battery in there. Zzz, there you go. You know, here's you apply the ohms. You know, Kirchhoff's voltage law, Kirchhoff current law. The Q is charged. Current is charged slowly. You get a little differential equation, looks exactly like the cooling of a potato problem, exactly. Except instead of temperatures and potatoes, it's resistors and, uh, and say, charge. But you have a steady state here at C capacitance times voltage. And, and you can see that what this thing is going to do, starting from initial different little st states, literally you could change the you could change the title on that from temperature to voltage and change the tick marks on here and it would be the same problem. It's got the same mathematical structure. Now, some of them can be um, uh, nonlinear. For instance, population dynamics. Here is, this, here is the word statement of the story. The rate of change of the population is equal to the birth rate minus the death rate plus the immigration rate. So, here are some classical ways of modeling this. We say birth rate is proportional to population. Population is like a number. You know, you count the number of people, like in the class it's 140. If we were just all a little community, that's uh, it, 140. The death rate is usually proportional to something like P squared, in other words, a higher, higher, uh, proportion. The idea here is, you know, birth rate proportional is the number of people, you know, it tends to be. But the death rate, as people get more crammed up, I mean, the, one of the reasons for this in, in, in field studies and biological things is that as the, as the, whether it's people or it's bacteria in a cell, cell, you know, distribution of stuff becomes more relevant, like disease becomes easier to spread around, like the, we've noticed about the virus. They say it's disproportionately important. Well, it's, it's disproportionately important. Uh, affecting people who are crammed together. That's what it's doing. I've also people not access to good healthcare makes a difference too. But I mean, that's what it's doing, you know. 
Um, when you're more crammed up, you tend to do it. And the S and be immigration right here, see? So now you put this together and now you get a neat little nonlinear equation here. See, it's nonlinear because of the P squared. So, you know, and, and if you're applied, and this is just like I said, P is population, you know? Count the number of people in the room. Right now, if I count the people in this room, it would be two. Okay, so, assuming there's no births, hopefully no deaths, and nobody immigrating into this room, that means at the end of this class, we're gonna have two, two, right? Because the right-hand side is zero, we're starting at two. However, if you've got a big population, there's gonna be births, deaths, and, and, and immigration. It depends where you apply this equation to. If you apply this equation to the United States, the immigration rate's gonna be very high. Everybody wants to come to the United States. If you apply this to the human race on the earth, mm. now there are flat earth society people, pretty much uh, barring the um, possibility of aliens coming to visit us, the S will be zero. I mean, it could be, you know, I mean, that might be flat. So here's a cool little equation, right? And it has this logistic equation. This is called the, um, the logistic equation. That's the form of it here. Now, if you look at this equation, where are its steady states? Well, you have to set the right-hand side equal to, you have a homework problem just about like this. You set the right-hand side equal to zero, and that will give you your steady state populations. The P star, obviously P equals zero is one, and P is one. K, the carrying capacity is another one. If you actually plotted that right-hand side, it would look like this. It's a frowning parabola, like that. And based on that, you can see that this population, the zero population is an unsteady, stable state. The carrying capacity is stable. So things will look like this, you see, from the carrying capacity. Now, I'll admit, I drew this. This was drawn with a computer, precisely drawn with a computer model. I took the tick marks off the graph. But I could have drawn this conceptually because, as you know, you, you know that anywhere here, the population is increasing. Increasing, there's decreasing and, and it's approaching the steady state here. Note that this is a model. That is. If, you know, if this is people, I guess they have to be, you know, let's say this is a population of rabbits. Okay, so it's a good example here, population of rabbits. All right. Now, let's start with one rabbit. Okay, one. Okay, let's say the carrying capacity is a thousand rabbits per thing in this field. You start with one rabbit, and that one rabbit grows into the thousand rabbits. And, but notice this is a model because you can instantly you tell me that, you know, um, Professor Vic, not only did I see some of this math in sixth grade, but I was taught in school that you need two rabbits of opposite sex to make another one. And I'm actually aware of that. But my model says that a rabbit can grow into more. I'll, I'll let me go further. You know what this model says? Is a rabbit foot can grow into a complete rabbit and then make a whole bunch more rabbits. You don't have to have one rabbit. You can have a, you can have point one rabbits and he goes. So it's it's even beyond that little boy girl thing. It's it's so what this amount of, amounts is that this is a model. Note that this is not saying. In Mother Nature, this is an absolute description of Mother Nature to the finest detail. It obviously is not. It's missing. We could list not only those things. We could list, you know, interacting species. We could enter, list a lot of things why this is not a perfect model, model of a rabbit population in Willard. But it's, it has met with surprising accuracy on a number of uh, biological studies. So it's a very popular model. And, and, and the thing is, it is a model. Therefore, it is not perfect. But what we hope is that it has some of the main ingredients to give us a good idea of the population we're trying to model. And it had, this one has proved the test of time. It's been a surprisingly good model for such a simple, simple equation. Anyway, that's, that, that modeling aspect goes into it. You know, certainly any kind of a mathematical model, you, we could sit there, let, let's spend all class making up a list of things not included in the model that could be real world effects. We go on and on. But you, the engineer, have hopefully will come up with um, enough insight and feel for the problem that when you're working in industry, you, you have enough insight to be able to model the thing at, 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 of interest 
in a way that's accurate but leaves out a lot of irrelevant effects. By definition, it, it will have some inaccuracies, but you hope as the engineer you're doing a good job with your modeling, but not overkilling every problem. So those, those are like first order problems.